As we've discussed on this show before, workers across the country are demanding better benefits, pay, and working conditions, as more and more strikes continue to take place in industries across the spectrum. From John Deere workers to the Alabama coal miners, Nabisco, Kellogg, and healthcare workers across the country are also taking to the picket lines, fighting for fair contracts. The movement has been dubbed Striketober by labor advocates. Uh, joining us now to discuss the nationwide wave of strikes is musician and historian jo Joey DeFrancesco. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks so much for having me. And so, so Joey, I wanted to have you on for two reasons. One, to get your expertise on, uh, on, on where to put the, these strikes in the context of labor history, but also because as, as last week we were talking about, uh, you know, almost, well, 10 years ago to th this month, you quit uh, well, your job in spectacular and ultimately viral fashion. I think we have, we can play a little bit of the video that, that whipped around the world uh, a decade ago. It still puts a smile on my face. Yeah. Uh, can, can you give us a little background? Um, how long had you been working at that hotel? What was the, what was the context of, of that moment? Yeah, so that moment did actually come out of a fairly long union fight at that hotel, the, the uh, Providence uh, Renaissance Marriott right in downtown there. So I worked in room service at that hotel for three and a half, four years. And like most service jobs, where now, you know, large majority of these people today and this month are quitting from, uh, it was an absolutely terrible job. You know, you're making this sub-minimum wage, um, supposed to be working off of tips, but they're not amounting anything. Your managers are taking a lot of your tips. Um, you're working crazy hours, you know, working 5 a.m. to midnight some days, these closed open shifts, um, getting abused by managers and by customers. And... Uh, me and the other workers at this hotel had been trying to work with Unite here to unionize this hotel to get some control over our working conditions, um, to get these shifts under control. Um, and you know, my coworkers did the much harder thing of staying at this hotel after I left and continuing to organize. And they actually won a union contract um, a few years ago after you know more than a decade of fighting at this hotel. But this quitting, this resignation very much came out of this union struggle of me fighting with that manager in the video for many, many years and wanting to give him, you know, one more message uh, before I left. So let's uh, let's fast forward to today. Now we're seeing uh, uh increased um, labor activity, and there's, I, I think, a sense that there could be some real progress made. What is your feeling? Are you optimistic? It's definitely very exciting to see uh, people finally fighting back in a big way here. Um, you know, this is the biggest wave of strikes we've seen in many years. You know, it's not up to levels of like 30s or 40s U.S., um, but certainly bigger than we've seen um, since, you know, especially like the 2010. So as you're mentioning, you're seeing workers at John Deere, um, nurses all over the country. In Rhode Island, we have some Teamsters on strike. Um, we have miners on strike. And again, it's all over the country. This is not localized in any one place. And we see very clearly that workers are refusing to accept this same deal they've been getting for the last few decades, right? I mean, we have COVID here as this important focal point as the kind of immediate impetus for a lot of this. Uh, but, you know, we know it's a really coming from since the late 70s, this steady decline in wages, steady decline in benefits. Um, say, decline in rates of unionization, and workers are not accepting this deal. So the, the makeup of the union movement today is obviously much different than it has been in the past, you know, decimated since, since the 70s. But, you know, as, as a labor historian and as somebody who's worked in some of these jobs, somebody who's been part of a union drive, what, ad, what advice would you have to today's workers about, you know, what, what works and what, what doesn't work? I think... 
we need to get organized. You know, we're seeing people quit in these huge numbers. You know, 4.3 million people quit their jobs um, over the last month. And, you know, that's a reflection of unorganized workers being very frustrated with jobs, refusing to go to work, seeing how much these companies made during COVID. Yeah, we were still being thrown into the meat grinder, expected to work, not getting any increased benefit from it while we're putting our lives at risk. And so we're seeing organized workers in union workplaces fighting for better contracts here. And we're seeing these masses of workers in unorganized industries, largely in the service sector, simply quitting, simply refusing to work. And that's likely having some effect, right, to push wages up, to push working conditions up. And that's good. But if we're really going to get somewhere, we have to, as workers, get into these places that aren't organized. And we're seeing this happen, right? We're seeing this happen with, with Amazon. Um, myself and other musicians over the past year started a new musicians union, largely unorganized workforce. Lots and lots of people across the country were trying to get in there and get organized. We're seeing museum workers get organized um, for the, the, the first time, right? Um, uh, and sort of these these end days of uh, the COVID pandemic. So uh, the quitting's great, refusing these conditions is great, but we also need to be getting organized. Three, two, one. And so, Joe, you talked about your your musical career and organizing musicians. Can you can you tell us a little bit about who those band members were in the hotel and what's become of them since then? What kind of music have you been up to? Yeah, so that band was a marching band I played in for many years called the What Cheer Brigade. That was, you know, the street marching band. And actually, at the hotel, um, after that video, we have some, you know, clips of this up on YouTube as well. Um, the band was coming back to the picket lines, and we had, you know, housekeepers and other workers in the hotel taking the instruments themselves and keep making noise. So, uh, you know, the, the music from that video continued to pester management for, for years after this video was made. Um, which is great. Um, I also play in a punk band called Downtown Boys um, that's been going on kind of since that, that video was made. But musicians like workers in the rest of the economy have seen many of the same you know, trends and conditions. Um, Spotify streaming services have come to dominate the music industry. Uh, over the pandemic, Spotify's valuation tripled right, and sixties and billions of dollars, uh, while musicians didn't get any kind of a raise from these streaming companies. So very similar trends we see elsewhere in the economy. And just like elsewhere in the economy, musicians have to fight back if we're gonna see anything change. Do, do we need uh, marching bands uh, in, is that what striking workers should do right now, bring in the marching bands? I think it's helpful. You know, picket lines can be really high energy things, but it can also be a lot of hours walking around in a circle. And I think the more you can uh, make some noise, get some fun, build some community at these picket lines, uh, it can definitely help. And I, I think I also saw somewhere that Downtown Boys uh, engaged in some type of protest against Coachella after you guys had played there. What, what happened there? Yeah, you know, there's some controversy over Coachella about the owners of Coachella, about how they're kind of treating their workers. Um, and so we did some issued some letters, spoke in some interviews um, about this festival. Um, and that, you know, that that made some headlines, I think, just because musicians have, have traditionally been sort of like unorganized, um, very scared to speak out against the power brokers. Um, in, in this industry. And so, yeah, Downtown Boys, you know, we, we've been involved for trying to win some more justice in, in this industry for quite a while. And one example is 2017. You know, we took on Coachella. Um, you know, a couple of years after that, us and a bunch of other musicians took on South by Southwest to change some of their contract clauses. So, you know, musicians are workers like uh, in other industries, and we have to organize and fight these, uh, fight the bosses. Was there any retaliation from speaking out against either South by Southwest or Coachella? It's hard to know. I'm sure there was. Um, haven't played Coachella since then. <laughs> uh, you know, people are scared. A lot of musicians are scared, for instance, to speak out against Spotify because they're like 80 something percent of the music industry. And if you don't get on that Spotify playlist as a musician, it's very, very hard to make it. Um, which you know underscores the need to do this collectively as as music workers to take on these companies. But we hear over and over and over again, a lot of musicians are scared to take on you know big festival companies or Spotify uh, because the industry is so murky and such a few number of people have so much power. Right, Joey, we really appreciate you joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you.
Next, Kim Iverson is back with us. We'll weigh in on Joe Rogan and CNN's ongoing war of words. Stay with us.